So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, thanks for being here. Um, today I'd like to uh, share with you an approach um, to help us improve control as designers over design, um, over design exploration, when coupling um, uh, engineering simulation and uh, parametric design systems um, uh, in search for, for, for some arch architectural artifacts. Um, in other words, uh, we're trying to improve control um, um, over design and performance-driven design. So uh, here the research scope is framed. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to start off by, by, by uh, highlighting a paradox that exists um, when coupling um, parametric design systems and engineering simulation. Also, this paradox was kind of referred to on a higher level in, in uh, today's earlier keynotes. Um, so the fundamental... The fundamental advantage of parametric design is the ability to loosely define a design problem, uh, which is an extremely valid approach in the early stages when things are sort of fluidly defined, um, nothing is sort of um, fixed. However, on the other hand, um, so however, on the other hand, um, engineering simulation tools um, are deterministic, which means that they require you to, um, which they require you to, to input a, fixed, a set of fixed values and output a fixed solution. So I will explain um, how this paradox uh, has an impact on our ability to control the exploration of design in the, in the coming slides. So uh, to do so, I'll, I'll first briefly explain how we would typically set up and utilize a coupled design analysis system. So most of you are obviously familiar with this, but I'll just briefly go over it. So to do this, I'll make use of, um, of a case study, um, sort of to motivate and to illustrate this approach. Um, by it's the, the case study is a well-known building um, by um, Pierre Luigi Nervi, and uh, so we would typically set up a parametric design system, uh, select uh, by selecting a set of design variables that best perhaps characterize the, uh, the the initial design intentions, and also select the ranges to define the bounds of the design space, so the ranges of the variables. Um, for simplicity, just a side note, for simplicity's sake, I'm making use of a frame model here, um, and to emulate the varying depth in the in, the, in Nervi's original structure, I'm discretizing the, the cross section along the frame. So, once we have the parametric design system set up, we can easily just hook it up with um, we can easily hook it up with a uh, in, engineering simulation tool. In this case, I'm using a millipede um, to uh, to oops, this needs to be playing to uh, either explore the design space by manually evaluating points in the parameter space, or automatically um, by using a stochastic algorithm, or a stochastic search algorithm, to search for the best design solution. Now, the point I'd like to make here is that um, stochastic search algorithms might turn up some interesting or surprising suggestions. However, the problem is, and this sets the, the research challenge, that when your design space is very large, especially because you're, you're dealing with many variables, um, then it's hard to control the quality of design and hard to control the direction of design. So it's hard to navigate. And also, because we, because we have this challenge to sort of navigate such a large design space, uh, it becomes hard to involve our own intuition and our own creativity into these design decisions. So um, the problem here is that um, simulation and... and uh, and also when we use stochastic algorithms, um, have a sort of deterministic um, output, a, a singular output, that does not give us much information or insight into the relationships between the design variables and into the, in this case, deflection into, into the physical behavior. So, in other words, it does not give us much information about... Okay, this... What's... I'm sorry, but it's uh, freezing. So it does not give us much information into the relationship between design variables and physical behavior, so in other words, between the cause and the effect. Um, so consequently, we, when we do not understand entirely or thoroughly uh, the design space or the relationships between the, between the two, we do not have the power sort of to manipulate the design direction creatively because we don't fully understand the constraints of the design, of the design space. So for this reason, um, in our research, we really emphasize that uh, the early stages of design demand much more. Um, the early stages of design demand systems that are capable, um, or that are capable of more than just simply optimization and evaluation. So 
this actually brings us to our approach, where we actually move towards the systems that represent a higher resolution of the design space, whereby probability distributions of sampled values in the design space um, are, are inputs, are, are uh, excuse me, so, so the, we, we represent a higher resolution of the design space, whereby the inputs um, are probability distributions of sampled values from the design space. So here I'm only showing a slice of, um, of, this, of the sample design space, because obviously it's a multi-dimensional space and not possible to illustrate. But I just wanted to show that um, in this case we make use of a sort of pseudo-random um, sampling method to get a, a good coverage um, of all regions of the design space. And um, on the other hand, the physical behavior is represented um, uh, by, by in this, which is in this, in this case, is the deflection of the structure by also a probability distribution of the corresponding simulation um, outcomes, um, simulation evaluations. So um, one thing I'd like to mention is that in classic statistics, uh, traditionally, perhaps we would reduce uh, relationships to a mathematical function, so relationships between two variables um, uh, to, a to a mathematical function. So when we talk about polynomial regression or these other methods, we would reduce these relationships to, um, to sort of a fixed, uh, an approximated relationship, which again, we're losing out on the information. So in this case, also because we want to keep things fluid, um, we, uh, in probability, we, we, the relationship between v variables, between distributions, is rep are represented as a joint probability distribution. So, uh, as you can see, it, does not, it, it, it contains all the information um, that we've collected. So, so, the idea here is that once we have um, this sort of statistical representation of the design space, when we have this sort of joint probability distribution, we can think of it like a, like a static pool of relationships. So, it's, it knows about all the relationships and it's there to be exploited. Um, we now can use uh, statistical methods, so in this case, I'll or statistical inference, um, to gain insight into the characteristics um, uh, of, of these relationships. So inference, by definition, is a statistical method um, to gain insight into uh, the cause of a distribution or, or um, the, the, the properties or the characteristics of the, distribu of the distribution. And this will, help us in, so this will help us gain a more global understanding of this problem, as, again, as opposed to looking at singular income, uh, inputs and outputs. Um, so in our approach, we take advantage of um, Bayesian inference, which is a type of statistical inference. Um, so with this Bayesian inference, uh, we can, uh, its advantage, and the advantage we take, uh, we, we, we make use of is the fact that it, it does not distinguish between inputs and outputs, uh, which is important for us, um, because we, it means we can infer cause from effect and effect from cause. And I'll explain for, with an example very soon. So, so the idea here is that, um, w again, with, w w with, this, with Bayesian inference, we can g gain a deeper insight into the relationships. And once we gain a deeper insight on these, into these relationships, um, we're, we, we can literally sort of use, uh, we can easily in involve our intuition and know the constraints within which we can actually work and sort of involve our, 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 sub our qualitative, subjective, uh, our own creative um, inputs. So just to explain a little, just a little in, in more detail what Bayesian inference is, um, it's represented by this uh, simple formula, which is known as Bayes' theorem. Bayes was a, a, a statistician. Um, and uh, it basically uh, says that what it basically estimates the probability of, let's say we have two variables, A and B, that are related. So it, it estimates the probability of distribution A, or the probability of A, um, given that, some, that uh, B has a particular value, or that B uh, it, it has some influence. So, in, in other words, it, 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 uh, uh, it estimates the relationship between A and B. So, if we were to in, uh, apply our own design analysis system to this rule, so let's say um, X is a design variable and Y is a simulation output, we, we, if we substitute those into the simple formula, we realize that we can actually predict input, we can predict the output from the input. So the probability of Y given a value for X. So the probability of, what is the probability of your simulation output of the physical behavior given that we have some input values, which is regular for us. Or the reverse, 
what is the probability of the output? What is the probability, um, so, excuse me, what is the probability of the output? Sorry. What is the probability of the input given the output? So what is the probability, um, what are the most likely input values that will give me this particular output? And I'll show you in, in a concrete example. So the important thing to, to, to mention here is that in probability, in the probability space, there's no difference between input, output, output, input. So that's the main advantage I'm taking, I'm taking uh, uh, forth here. So one more layer of detail I'd like to add is that um, big, when, when uh, we're dealing with uh, big, again, big problems with many variables, uh, it's computing the joint probability distribution and computing inference over, over so many variables can be very daunting um, if, if we were to do this manually, uh, just simply using Bayes' rule. So I take advantage of uh, Bayesian networks, which is, uh, which is founded on Bayes', uh, Bayes theorem, but that can handle uh, multiple, uh, can, that can handle complex joint probability distributions quite well and quite efficiently. Just very briefly, uh, it's just a, a type of statistical model that's sort of a, uh, a graph in the form of a mathematical graph. Um, the actual name is a probabilistic graphical model where the nodes represent uh, the variables, distributions, and the edges represent sort of a causal uh, relationship. And uh, w what it does, it computes uh, the joint probability distribution over everything. So once you have this network, you can literally perform inference and explore from one node to another, and you can really sort of gain insight into, into this problem. Now in our case, in simulation, uh, uh, in design analysis systems, which, which is what we're dealing with, it's, qu oh, it's quite intuitive. So it's generally just uh, inputs to outputs. So the, the edges are, so, so the inference only happens between inputs to outputs and outputs to inputs. So there's, there's no other sort of direction. So once we have this, once we have this um, representation of our design problem, so we have uh, we have sort of this um, uh, this sort of static pool of of of, of knowledge. We can now explore it um, in either way using inference. So when, so if we go back to my example, if, to the to the uh, to the structural example, um, we can use base. Uh, we, we we implemented a Bayesian network to handle the, the complex joint probability distribution. And now we can make use of Bayesian inference to explore the two, and I'll show you how. So just a side note, in the, the distributions right now are what we call are in their marginal state, which means that, as you can see, the, um, the distributions are somewhat uniform because we sampled the space pseudo-uniformly. So they're actually, they're not really uniform, they're sort of almost uniform. Um, so this is the marginal state before any inferences has occurred. So let's start. For example, once, once we have this set up, we can, we can predict um, the probability of the maximum deflection for, let's say, a, rain, uh, let's say a set of inputs. So this is what we would normally do. Um, but in this case, we select uh, the bins, so the bins and in the, in the input histograms that will contain the values that we are interested in to analyze. And through inference, we can predict the output. So the value here, as you can see, is not, is, it's not a single value, it's a distribution. So the mean, for verification's sake, um, the mean of this distribution corresponds to the actual output value of the simulation for these corresponding input values, which, I mean, it's quite close. So in fact, this we can treat as a, as a, um, as a proxy model or as a surrogate model, as was mentioned yesterday. Um, that sort, of that sort of replaces the, the numerical simulation, and that's a much more, obviously much faster to compute. The, the, in this case, the frame analysis is quite efficient, but this can obviously work for, um, and for a simulation that is kind of perhaps more computationally expensive. Um, so yeah, so, we, so we, this is one, one direction, back to our marginal state. Now we can also do the reverse. So we can say, for example, I'd like to query so I'd like to query what is the probability um, of the input values. Let's say we have a, we have a goal in mind. Um, uh, we have a threshold where we want to see, we want to look at only configurations that, um, are, that have the maximum deflection of 14 millimeters and below. Uh, so, we, so again, you simply set the, the bin that's corresponding to the value where we are interested in to 100%. So that's your... 
So that so that's your your evidence, which is what what is what is the proper term that is used. Um, and as you can see, because we have this, because we compute this uh, this the inference, so the using Bayes theorem, we can update the distributions, and this is quite significant because now that w what we're seeing on the left hand side is are two things, two main things. So if you compare the uniform, the marginal states to the updated ones, you can already tell that two of the distributions are particularly sensitive or significant. And this already gives you some insight into which variables, which design variables you should be careful of, um, and which others are sort of more free to, to play around with, again, so to suit your perhaps creative needs. But in this case, now we, we already know, we already have quick insight about these two particular variables, which, which in fact are the structural depth, which is obvious, and, uh, and also the span. Um, also, we know that now we can simply search. So we can search within those, uh, as a designer, sort of it becomes a bit more intuitive. So you, simply, you know that by searching through the, through the highest peaks, we'll give, we'll give you um, configurations that are within, within your goal. And that's, that's important. So you can think of this as, um, th these cutoff lines can be set perhaps by like an, by an engineer perhaps and uh, the model is given to a designer and so there is a certain element of freedom within which you can search but you're sort of within the safe within a safe zone um, structurally speaking so okay so also um, we can also add we can also add multiple outputs so when we when we add multiple outputs we can explore we can perform the uh, here i will only perform perform reverse inference so we can say what are the most likely input values if i would like to um, look at configurations that are that have a again maximum deflection of 40 millimeters or, or less or a weight of or 462 tons um, or less. So again, we will update the distributions, and now, literally, a designer can sort of search within the peaks, knowing that within those areas, um, it's most likely to sort of satisfy these two goals. So the idea here is that we're not only sort of optimizing um, or, or, or trying to be, we're just simply being aware of being aware of the entire space because we're of the entire uncertainty in the space because we can see the entire distribution but also we can sort of draw lines within which we can search so we're, we can think of it as a sort of reduction of the ambiguous design space that we start with to a space that is um, that, that is much that is that is smaller but that is all that is more informed so uh, it's it's that is more meaningful to our design goal um, also I'd like to say that this approach could be used as a sort of uh, this reduction approach could be used uh, prior to optimization, perhaps. So uh, to, to reduce the size of the design space, such that uh, you eliminate the redundant uh, the redundant parts of the space that are that are that do not consider uh, that maybe do not contain particular solu so optimal solutions, and to the ones that actually do. I mean, again, I must make a disclaimer. It dis de depends, obviously, uh, as well, on the type of sampling method you use and on the resolution of the sampling method that you use in the earlier stages of this process. Um, but uh, we are more interested here in insight um, than sort of uh, accuracy. So um, to conclude, I'm at 17 minutes. Okay, good. So to conclude, uh, I'd like to say that, so in this presentation, we've saw, we saw that enabling statistical inference in the design space um, helps us to learn about the underlying relationships of our design problem, but also reduce the ambiguity of design space to regions that are more meaningful to our goals. And um, we emphasize that it is really important and it's essential for us to understand the systems that we design. So we tend to treat the system as a black box eventually. When, so when we plug in all these plugins, and it gets a bit crazy, the, the, and it's just a matter of then it becomes an it just becomes an, an the experience becomes a matter of simply playing with the sliders and looking at the output. But it would be nice if we could actually understand the relationships to get a really f a good a good global picture. Once we get that picture, we can then really truly play around with the problem. And this and I feel that with this approach, this is a rather simple simple example. But I really feel that with this approach, um, 
uh, you can sort of, sort of can deal with maybe really complex um, partic complex phenomena like some, uh, I had I was working on a project dealing with contact analysis, which is something really sort of like from the mechanical engineering side. But actually, this approach helped us understand certain principles um, um, from the, from the design side, and this, so we, we it helped us understand the relationships and where to search uh, between the design side and also this this sort of uh, mechanical engineering aspect. So it is really important to understand the, the system that we set up so that we can actually control the system and the control the quality of design. Uh, also, th the positive, the, the outcome of, of, of dealing with, um, so the, the outcome of our approach of dealing with sort of a, a probabilistic approach is that we can still keep it loosely defined. And as, as Usman, I believe, earlier s men said, um, uh, why do we have to sort of come to, a, to, a, to one point? Why do we have to come why do we have to converge to a solution? It should be about understanding, sort of, uh, we, we, in, especially in the early stages, we, we work in ranges. We work sort of with this uncertainty. We should embrace the uncertainty and not converge, but converge over time, perhaps. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. I was looking forward to, to seeing this in a way that I was not sure how you would present statistical research. Yeah. In, it's quite, you, tr you tried it with the images and it's still not easy. <laughs> um, and it's also just to, to have a feedback directly also, what I find mm -hmm. interesting is that you're talking like a structural engineer more or less, looking for solutions, which is a bit, uh, with the statistical approach, it also means that you defer a little bit uh, the, the, the possibility of choosing yourself. You make sure that you limit the choices in a way. It's, it's an interesting approach, but don't you have, uh, aren't you afraid that you are limiting too much? Because what is nice with the others is that with the data, we're actually, I have the feeling we're opening other fields. We could actually allow ourselves for more data and more inputs and more open visions. And I have the feeling if we adapt it all of a sudden or we limit it to a kind of uh, uh, analysis, a, a statistical approach, it makes already that you limit your field of possibilities. So do you mean limitation within, the, within a design space or beyond that? Uh, it, I mean, the idea here is to sort of, I mean, there is a cutoff line. So there's a, there's a non-feasible zone that's simply non-feasible beyond design. I mean, if it just cannot stand, it cannot stand. So yeah, but maybe you should just restart this another solution. Yes, of course. I mean, it, the, so the point here is, uh, that the outcome of, of one of sort of, of one of this iteration helps you in, to inform the next redefinition of the problem, and that's totally fine. But with the knowledge of insights, uh, knowing which variables are important, which are not, and knowing their, their, their consequence on, on the behavior in this case. So it's not simply meant to be a one static um, exercise, but meant to be a one, one part of the loop of, uh, of redefining and redefining the design problem. But uh, thank you for your question. Uh, some other questions? Sorry, yeah, Caitlin, I was hoping you would ask a question. <laughs> I expected it. Uh, uh, thank you, Zach. Um, I'll start by saying uh, I'm a believer, and I think uh, maybe what you're doing is not limiting your options, but just organizing them better to help people find them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, when you look at a design space, it's like a vague space. So, so it can be very large. Yeah. Um, so one of the, the things that, that one of the questions that Klaus brings up, though, is it's very hard to communicate this information to designers. And I think you're doing a good job with these histograms where it's starting to be visual and starting to be somewhat intelligible. But how do, how do we educate designers um, about how to understand these, these visualizations and what they mean and how to act on them? I think we still have a ways to go in order yeah. to make this useful. So um, actually, thank you for your question. Uh, one of my intentions, I should have included a future work page. Uh, one of my intentions is to now that now now that we have uh, now that I can understand, we have the ability to understand the effect or the influence on uh, on the behavior in this case, in terms of the input values. So sort of the input values are are what what a designer would sort of relate to, right? The ge the geometric in this case, geometric variables. So I feel that sort of this approach is a translation translation mechanism from the behavior to the inputs. So now we know. Uh, we have the sort of we have the feedback in terms of the inputs. So now I can actually map this onto some. I can actually visualize this. I'm trying to do this. I, I have some difficulties. 
so the, um, to, the plan is to visualize the, the histograms in terms of um, prob most, most probable uh, geometries. So you can think of it as a sort of gradation of geometries overlapped, where the opacity of the, of the, of the uh, geometry indicates the intensity or indicates the, the distribution, uh, sorry, indicates the probability in the distribution. So I, I think that uh, th I, can, I, will always, I will always continue to sort of try to convince them toward, to look at the histogram, but I also want to go beyond that and um, to engage more people in, with this approach, because the approach here is not simply to use statistical methods, it's to understand the design space and understand and sort of go beyond using tools as a black box, but literally understanding what you're doing. And once you gain sort of this understanding, you gain this control you can actually use. So I feel in, uh, this, at this point, this is all I can think of, uh, which is this visualization aspect. And uh, hopefully, when, if I can simply, if they, hopefully if they can see this uh, in their, uh, in their, in their, on the screens, they could, they could be able to infer um, better design decisions. Okay, we have uh, two other questions. Yeah. Wait. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll keep thank it short. you. Uh, this is really great research. Like thank you. I understand that thanks to your tool, we could somehow replace our intuition because, like, somebody with uh. a great like structural engineer with intuition should know how to limit yes the sliders and reduce the dimensionality himself or herself to have similar effects. So basically, you help us to reduce dimensionality by uh, without our intuition about design space. Uh, but I see some, I don't know, like maybe it's not a drawback, but uh, it's a question. Because, of course, designer not always knows what is the function he uh, or she formulates. And not exactly always, it's uh, that small uh, change on the slider uh, causes a small change in the fitness function. So basically, our fitness landscape is totally bumpy or over constrained or, uh, and I think that, uh, do you think this method could be also efficient in these cases? So, sorry, I didn't understand the, the last part of your question okay. regarding, regarding the, 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 the fitness. If, Can you repeat? If the, if the fitness landscape uh, it's not, uh, doesn't have any gradient, it's not really smooth, and it's just totally bumpy. So, for example, I don't know, we have a network of, a network of roads, and by changing slider, you're changing the totally road that is in the part of the city. I don't know, like, and, and it causes totally change of the fitness function. Um, I, 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 I don't see how, how this... Uh, so the the the, hist the the I'm not this, I'm not actually visualizing a a, a, form, a form of fitness function here. I'm I'm simply v um, visualizing uh, sort of the, uh, the relationships um, between variables. So um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to reply to your question because I'm not sure, entirely sure what. what the, but we can we can talk, I guess. Um, <coughs> my my question. Um, I'm I'm a little bit afraid. I I, I listened. I tried to understand. Uh, but I think, uh, of course, when I see this uh, histogram over the sliders, uh, it's, it's completely clear what to do, but uh, you don't know really what the sliders are. You can't make this sliders that abstract. They are anything. So yeah. when you don't understand what a slider has for an influence for the outcome, by learning, by learning by really learning and trying to understand what the influence is, yeah. and not just by reading histograms. Um, you can't avoid it. So the designer has to learn by, of course, playing, but then the yeah. deep, getting a deep understanding what parameters influence, really. Yeah. Um, and then only he can uh, understand the structure of the positivity space, I, I think, because only the sliders, I, I, I understand, uh, more than three dimensions are difficult to understand. So this is, this is an opportunity to, to, to learn to, to work on these multidimensional systems. That's, that's great. But um, the structure of the spaces is also described by mathematical methods, maybe, you should uh, uh, put, put together with, with like these attractor things and so, to describe these multidimensional things. And uh, you can't just reduce this uh, maybe to the sliders. Yeah. Th th thanks for your question um, or your comment. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Um, so there, it's, there's, a, there's a sort of fine line between um, showing the deep insight to making it simplified. So my my intention here to map to sort of visualize this information in, in terms of the sliders was because I felt that this is what designers are familiar with. But the truth is, as you're saying, it, it, it's, it becomes another black box. So 
uh, and the issue again is with high dimensional design spaces is that you cannot just visualize, uh, you cannot plot this data, you cannot visualize this kind of data. So I felt that what I was trying to do here was um, when I showed earlier the difference, when I went back and forth and I showed the difference between the marginal distribution and the updated distribution, there is, you can, you, it's an eyeball, it's, I mean, it's kind of descriptive statistics. So um, you, could, you can kind of see, uh, you can gain some insight into a sensitivity. So a sensitivity of a variable actually is good insight about a design problem. So that's already, a, um, it's not necessarily, necessarily completely just visual. Um, I, I obviously, this is very, very initial stages and I need to improve it definitely, but uh, I have this in mind. And uh, somehow I need, to, so hopefully by also sh visualizing them in the, on the geometry itself, I need to come up with some, it's very hard, it's a very hard problem. I need to come up with some, some way of showing, of, of visualizing relationships in terms of the geometry. And that particular uh, issue right there is, is, is quite challenging. Um, but I, I try to, yeah, uh, yeah, you have a good point. And I, I'm trying to steer away from that, but. <laughs> okay, we're gonna, uh, we yes, can thank put you. this Thanks. further on somewhere else.